Hello viewers, today we are going to look into three major kidney disorders and their dietary management. One is nephrotic syndrome and the other two are acute and chronic renal failure. But before that, let us just have a look at the physiology and the functions of kidneys. Kidneys are bean shaped structures, each about the size of a fist and they weigh about 150 grams in males and about 135 grams in the females. They are typically 10 to 12 centimeters in length, 5 to 7 centimeters in width and 2 to 3 centimeters in thickness. Each kidney contains around a million units called nephrons, each of which is a microscopic filter for the blood. It's possible to lose as much as 90% of the kidney function without experiencing any symptoms or problems. The functions of kidneys are the most important. It maintains body composition and balances the body fluids. That is, it regulates fluid volume, its osmolality, electrolyte concentration and the pH by varying the excretion of water and ions in the urine. It removes waste products from the body, typically urea and uric acid. It removes drugs and foreign substances like toxins from the body. It releases renin which is produced by the juxtaclamorular apparatus and catalyzes the formation of angiotensin that regulates blood pressure and the salt balance. The proximal tubule cells produce the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol that promotes strong healthy bones by regulating body calcium and phosphorus. They control the production of RBCs. Erythropoietin stimulates the maturation of RBCs in the bone marrow. Now let us look into the each disease and the dietary management. Nephrotic syndrome is a kidney disorder that causes the body to excrete too much of protein in urine. Nephrotic syndrome can be primary that is being a disease specific to the kidneys or it can be secondary that is being a renal manifestation of a systemic general illness. In all cases, injury to glomeruli is an essential feature. The primary causes of nephrotic syndrome include the minimal change disease. This is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. This disorder results in abnormal kidney function, but when the kidney tissue is examined under a microscope, it appears normal or nearly normal. The cause again typically can't be determined. The other one is the focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. It is characterized by scattered scarring of some of the glomeruli. This condition may result from another disease or a genetic defect or again for no known reason. Then there is membranous nephropathy. This kidney disorder is a result of thickening membranes within the glomeruli. The exact cause of the thickening again is not known but it sometimes is associated with medical conditions like hepatitis B, malaria, lupus or cancer and then hereditary nephropathies. But then again you must have seen that the cause many a times is not really known. The secondary causes include diabetes mellitus. Diabetes can lead to kidney damage what is called as diabetic nephropathy and it affects the glomeruli. Then there is systemic lupus erythematosus. This chronic inflammatory disease leads to serious kidney damage. Then amyloidosis and paraproteinemias. This disorder occurs when substances called amyloid proteins accumulate in the organs. This builds up often affects the kidneys damaging their filtering system. Then there are viral infections like hepatitis B, C and HIV. Then the blood clot in the kidney vein. The renal vein thrombosis occurs when the blood clot blocks a vein connected to the kidney and it can cause nephrotic syndrome. There can be heart failure. Some forms of heart failure such as constrictive pericarditis and severe right heart failure can cause nephrotic syndrome. And in pregnant women, preeclampsia can precipitate nephrotic syndrome. Now there are certain factors which increase the risk of nephrotic syndrome. Some of these are medical conditions like diabetes, lupus, amyloidosis, minimal change disease and some of the other kidney diseases. 
than certain medications. Now these can also damage the kidneys and cause nephrotic syndrome. These include NSAIDs that is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or certain drugs which are used to fight infections. Then certain infections themselves can increase the risk of nephrotic syndrome like HIV, malaria and also hepatitis B and C. Now the typical signs and symptoms that are associated with nephrotic syndrome include severe swelling that is edema particularly around the eyes in ankles and the feet. The urine is foamy this is because of the excess protein that is lost in the urine and because of the water retention that is edema there can be weight gain. Some of the complications that are associated with nephrotic syndrome include blood clot that is the inability of the glomeruli to filter blood leads to loss of blood proteins that help prevent clotting and there is an increased risk of developing a blood clot what is known as the thrombus. Then there can be elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides. When the level of protein albumin falls, liver makes more albumin and parallel releases more cholesterol and triglycerides. Poor nutrition. Now this is because of there is too much of loss of proteins and this can result in malnutrition. This can lead to weight loss but because of edema or the water retention it is masked and it appears that the patient has not lost weight. Then because of the malfunctioning of these hormones there can be anemia and there can be low levels of both vitamin D and calcium in the body. Then elevated blood pressure is again a typical symptom associated with nephrotic syndrome. Now this is because the glomeruli is damaged and there is a buildup of waste in the bloodstream which is known as uremia, accumulation of urea uric acid in blood. This causes a rise in BP. There can be acute kidney failure that is when the damaged glomeruli cannot remove the waste products their levels in the blood increase and many a times emergency dialysis may be needed. Dialysis is an artificial means of removing extra fluids and also the waste from the body. Chronic kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome can cause kidneys to gradually lose their function over a period of time and when the kidney function falls low enough, patient requires either dialysis or a kidney transplant. Then infections. People with nephrotic syndrome are susceptible to other types of infections. There are quite a few tests which help in diagnosing whether the patient is suffering from nephrotic syndrome. Urine test, that is it checks the presence of proteins. Generally, a patient is asked to collect urine sample for 24 hours to get an exact amount of proteins that are lost from the body. Then blood test, blood levels of albumin are low what is known as hypoalbuminemia. This is often decreased because the proteins is lost in the urine but it is also associated with elevated levels of blood cholesterol and triglycerides. Serum creatinine and blood urea levels are also assessed to see how the kidneys are functioning. Biopsy can also be done where a special needle is inserted a small sample of kidney tissue is collected and sent to the lab for testing to assess the actual cause of nephrotic syndrome. Now treatment. Treatment involves treating the underlying medical condition that may be causing nephrotic syndrome. Medications are given to control the signs and symptoms and treat the complications that are associated with the nephrotic syndrome. The medications that are generally included in the treatment are blood pressure medication. The drugs which are called as angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are given to reduce the blood pressure and it also reduces the amount of proteins that are lost in urine. Diuretics help in increasing the kidneys output that's why there is excess urine formation and the water that is accumulated in the body is lost. Cholesterol reducing medications are also necessary. These are what are known as statins and they help lower cholesterol levels. However, even today there is no exact clarity as to how exactly it improves the outcome. Blood thinners are also given. 
these are the medications which are called as anticoagulants they help decrease the blood's ability to clot and thus reduces the risk of developing blood clots then immune system suppressing medications can be given which are typically corticosteroids this decreases the inflammation that is associated with this kidney disorder now coming to the actual dietary management the aim of the treatment is to decrease the manifestation of the syndrome that is most importantly edema and the hyperlipidemia secondly to replace the nutrients that are lost from the body to reduce the risk of progressive renal disease and atherosclerosis so if we look into the typical nutrient management first is energy generally adequate energy intake is recommended that is about 35 kilocalories per kg per day this is needed to achieve and maintain the ideal body weight and also make sure that the protein stores are maintained foods that are rich in complex carbohydrates should provide the majority of the calories proteins generally 0.8 grams per kg per day is recommended restriction reduces the excretion of proteins it decreases the protein degradation oxidation of amino acids and thereby helps in maintaining nitrogen balance since albumin losses in urine are due to increased catabolism rather than the reduction in protein synthesis low protein diets which decrease catabolism are more beneficial this moderately low intake decreases proteinuria and may slightly increase the serum albumin levels one additional gram of dietary protein for each gram lost in urine is to be added a vegetarian diet based on soy protein flax seeds are often used for reducing urinary protein loss increasing serum proteins and they also have a lipid lowering effect and reduce the renal inflammation and fibrosis it offers a very convenient way to provide adequate but not excessive proteins animal proteins though have proteins of high biological value have more fat content and are also rich in sodium and that is the reason have to be very judiciously used in the diet in protein depleted patients and in children the protein intake suggested is 1.2 grams per kg per day and this is to avoid the hazards of growth retardation when it comes to lipids a diet that is low in saturated fats and cholesterol that is less than 200 mg per day and the fat it should be less than 30% of the total calories but at the same time the fat should be rich in pufa that is polyunsaturated fatty acid this has to be combined with the loss of excess weight because it is recommended to reduce the risk of cardiovascular diseases low fat vegetarian diets are much more effective for lipid control and usually lead to a reversal of atherosclerotic disease cholesterol lowering drugs can be used if needed sodium and fluid a limit on sodium of 1 to 3 grams per day is usually recommended to control edema and hypertension diuretics are needed because they need to flush out the excess fluid in the body supplement of calcium b vitamins and zinc can be beneficial to the patient but iron is not given unless the patient is anemic the following clinical values have to be monitored regularly when taking care of the dietary management serum albumin and total protein urinary protein gfr dietary protein fat and cholesterol daily weight and the serum lipids now we we'll look into the other segment of the renal diseases that is the renal failure which can be either acute or chronic when we use the word acute renal failure we are talking about the sudden onset and it can also be referred to as acute kidney injury chronic renal failure builds up slowly with very few symptoms in the early stages let us first look at the acute renal failure acute renal failure or arf occurs when kidneys suddenly become unable to filter waste products from the blood dangerous levels of these waste materials may accumulate in the blood with arf the kidney often returns to normal or near normal after the underlying cause is treated it develops rapidly over a few hours or a few days 
it is most commonly seen in patients who are already hospitalized particularly the critically ill patient it can be fatal and requires intensive treatment however it can be reversible if otherwise the patient is in good health acute kidney failure can occur when the blood flow to the kidneys is slowed it can happen when there is a blood or fluid loss as is typically seen in burns or in severe dehydration it can be in heart disease infections liver failure allergy or even because of a reaction to certain drugs there can be a direct damage to the kidneys the blood clots in the veins or the arteries of the kidneys the cholesterol deposits that block the blood flow to the kidneys there can be glomerulonephritis lupus medications toxins or even vasculitis or sometimes the ureters become blocked and the waste can't leave the body through the urine which can happen in the case of stones or even in case of cancers the typical signs and symptoms that are associated with arf are decreased urine output although occasionally urine output is normal there is fluid retention causing swelling in legs ankles and feet that can be drowsiness short of breath because of the fluid that is accumulated in the lungs there can be fatigue confusion nausea there can be seizures or coma also in severe cases chest pain or pressure on the chest is also a very common symptom typically again like all other renal diseases the diagnosis related to the urine output urine test and the blood test the urine output measurements are the amount of urine that is actually excreted in 24 hours which helps in determining the cause of kidney failure urine test gives us the abnormal levels of the components which will help in revealing the abnormalities related to kidney failure blood test helps us in assessing the levels of urea and creatinine imaging test such as ultrasound or computerized tomography and of course the biopsy which help in the diagnosis of arf treatment treating the underlying cause of kidney failure that damaged the kidneys and then treat the primary cause treating complications until the kidneys recover restoring fluid balance medications to control potassium as it can be dangerous can cause arrhythmias and muscle weakness medications are given to restore the blood calcium levels dialysis might be needed to remove toxins from the blood while the kidneys also heal dialysis also helps in improving the excess potassium when kidney function falls below 10% of the normal dialysis is absolutely essential and sometimes kidney transplant may be essential if we look at the nutritional management energy in uncomplicated patients the energy requirement varies from 25 to 30 calories per kg per day lipids 20 to 30% of the energy requirements has to be through lipids of course in critically ill patients a combination of both glucose and lipids work well however in hyperlipidemia high intake of fat is not administered proteins initially 40 grams per day of high quality protein is given which is roughly equal to 0.6 grams per kg per day the intake can be gradually increased to 0.8 grams per kg per day so long as the bun value is less than 80 in case of peritoneal dialysis 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kg per day and in hemodialysis 1 to 1.2 grams per kg per day is recommended to compensate for the increased catabolism and also the loss of amino acids during dialysis generally the water intake is restricted to 400 ml plus the amount that is equal to the urine output in 24 hours sodium and potassium both 2 grams per day and calcium 200 mg per day is recommended coming to the third segment of the kidney disorders is the chronic renal failure or the crf it builds slowly with very few symptoms in early stages it is a permanent loss of kidney function a patient with crf may not have any symptoms until the kidney function declines to 20% or even less treating the cause such as high blood pressure or high blood sugar levels can slow the disease crf can lead to end stage kidney disease 
Some of the most common causes of chronic renal failure are high blood pressure, chronic glomerulonephritis, high blood sugar levels that is typically seen in diabetic patients, polycystic kidney disease, blocked urinary tract which can be because of stones or even cancers or it could be repeated kidney infections. If we look at the goals of nutrition therapy, they are number one, to maintain the body protein stores. Secondly, to prevent uremic symptoms of limiting the accumulation of nitrogenous waste product. Most importantly, to see if we can slow down the rate of progression of the CKD. Then, to improve the patient's outcomes and comorbid conditions like anemia, CVD and the bone disease. This is how the nutritional requirements in case of CKD are determined, predominantly based on the GFR. If the GFR or the glomerular filtration rate is more than equal to 70, then there is no restriction in protein, energy can be normal, carbohydrate and fat also can be normal. The concern is when the GFR falls down to 25 to 70, then protein content intake of the diet has to be reduced to 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kg per day. The energy has to be roughly equal to 35 calories per kg per day. Fat has to be 30 to 40 percent and the rest of the calories has to be from carbohydrates, most importantly the complex carbohydrates. Same is the case when the GFR is 5 to 25 and the protein is 0.6 grams per kg per day. Energy has to be a little over 35 calories per kg per day. Fat 30 to 40 percent of the total calories and carbohydrates roughly 50 percent and that too predominantly the complex carbohydrates. Simple sugars can very easily get converted to fatty acids. But when the GFR is less than 5 and the patient is on hemodialysis, the protein intake can be 1 to 1.2 with 50% of the proteins from high biological value. Energy can be 30 to 35 calories per kg per day and fat has to be 25 to 30% of the calories. 50% of the energies can be from complex carbohydrates. When the GFR goes below 5 and the patient is on peritoneal dialysis, Proteins can be 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kg per day. 50% of them have to be from high biological value. Energy 30 to 35 calories per kg per day. Fat 25 to 30% of the total calories and carbohydrates roughly should contribute 50% of the energy predominantly from the complex carbohydrates. Sovinium and water again become very important and in advanced renal insufficiency where the GFR goes less than 10 ml per minute, the ability to excrete sodium is also reduced. In such cases, diuretics almost certainly are administered and sodium recommendation is about 1000 to 3000 milligrams per day. Water recommendation is about equal to the amount of urine output per day and an allowance of 500 ml is recommended. In renal failure, potassium is retained in the body and this can cause hyperkalemia. There can be arrhythmias and it can be very fatal and that is why potassium is restricted to 2 grams per day. So in conclusion, it can be said that kidney diseases can occur because of many factors like infections, autoimmune diseases and most important cause is diabetes. Urine analysis, blood test, ultrasound, biopsy, can give a clear picture as to the real cause of these diseases. The goal of dietary management is to treat the underlying cause, restore the nutritional status, prevent further damage that is try to improve the overall health of the patient. Protein, sodium, potassium and water are the most important nutrients that need to be monitored irrespective of, of the disease. Thank you.